Ladies and gentlemen, Afro Zen All Stars.
Thank you so very much. We are Afros and All-Stars. We are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be here. <clears throat> we're going to play we're going to play a number of things from the motherland today. Uh, that first piece was from South Africa. It was written by the late great trumpeter Mangizi Feza. It's called Sonia. And we're going to follow that. We're going to follow that with another piece from South Africa. And this one's written by uh, the great Chris McGregor. Chris McGregor was a white South African jazz pianist who uh, is noteworthy for the revolutionary act of forming the first integrated jazz band in apartheid South Africa. He was a great man. He wrote a ton of great music. And uh, uh, for, for his troubles, he was um, exiled. Uh, but the name of the song is Do It.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> it was, actually, maybe it's time to meet the band. On my far left, we have Chris Vasi on guitar. Next to him is Susie Fisher on alto and baritone saxes. Very special guest. Next to me here is Myrick Crampton on alto and tenor. Behind me is Brian Cruz, the mighty Brian Cruz on bass. On drums, Scott Milstead. On the congas, Keith Cable. And I'm George Lowe. So we're going to continue with a piece from Guinea. And this song was originally um, recorded in 1961 by Bembea Jazz National. And um, part of its historical significance is that um, there's, a, there's a wonderful traditional African instrument that appears all over the continent uh, with various names. But it's the, uh, um, the instrument from which um, the West derived the marimba and the vibraphone. It's called the balafon. And this song was one of the very first um, examples of a modern African group incorporating uh, traditional instruments. And it's called Arme Ganin. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Chris Vasi on guitar. So we're primarily known for playing music from Ethiopia, which we haven't done yet this evening. So we're gonna fix that. This is a tune that's based on a piece of classic Ethiopian music written by the great Mulatu Estatke back in the 70s. And it's called Woo Beat.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, Afros and all stars. Bringing nothing but heat tonight. I guess now we know what summer sounds like. <laughs> George, I kind of learned a little bit more about how you're playing. Would you join me for a conversation over here? Certainly. George, thank you so much for that first set of music with the Afros and all stars. What a night this has been. I've got several questions for you. The first, the first is not the normal first question. I'm interested in how did you come to the name Afros and All Stars? The, the name Afros and All Stars, um, uh, came from, it was inspired by, actually it was inspired by a, a dear friend, Reggie Pace from No BS Brass. Oh yes. And uh, the band that I was in before this, um, we played some African music and he sat in with us and he referred, uh, he referred to what we were doing as Afro Zen Ethio Funk. Oh, wow. And Ethio I thought that funk. was just inspired. <laughs> and so when I formed this band um, at, the, at the beginning, when we got started six years ago, 85% of what we did was, was um, either classic Ethiopian music or based on or inspired by classic Ethiopian music, and um, <clears throat> and I remembered him saying that, and I thought that I thought that Afro Zen was a perfect description mm -hmm. of the music itself. Mm -hmm. And as I went about setting up the band, um, I, I approached I, I approached musicians around town that I knew to be heavyweights, that I knew right. to be just fabulous pros, right. wonderful players, and uh, um, and they are all-stars. So the band is the all-stars, Afrozen is the music. I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, whether you meant to or not, I felt a little 
like I was in a bit of a trance with the, the polyrhythms we experienced here tonight. That was, that was beautiful. Let me back up to the question I was supposed to ask you first. Tell us something about yourself in your own words. Um, I, am, um, I am a man who is uh, obsessed with musical traditions mm -hmm. from around the world. As, as uh, uh, an American white boy, I feel, <laughs> I feel somewhat cheated. If you look around the world, they're uh, all over the world. Um, all aspects of life are punctuated by, by music. Yes. And as an American white boy, what do I have? Here comes the bride. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, uh, it lacks. It lacks soul and beauty and pathos, and you look around the world, and it's all there. And mm. um, so that's, um, that's a, a, a very significant thing about me. I think you have definitely found some pathos uh, that pours out of your heart, I think, and, and into your fingers. How did you get into music? Um, I've, I've been obsessed by music uh, for as long as I can remember. My, my earliest memory is of, of being, uh, my mother tells me that I was three years old, but I, I remember standing, standing on uh, a little stool and having my ear against the radio, and I was obsessed with um, the song El Paso by Marty Robbins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I've been obsessed with music for, for my whole life. It's... Uh, it's my, my primary love. When did you begin to play? I started playing the guitar when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, over time, um, years later, I, I, got, I got real interested. I, I had terrible performance anxiety, so I didn't want to be in a band. But I, I had a lot of ideas, and I, I, I wrote a lot, of, a lot of music in my head, and I, I I would practice eight hours a day, and and at one point, I, w I was playing nine different instruments and was able to write music, record it all with me playing all of the parts, and and uh, um, and I I did a lot of that. As a teenager? No, no. This is years later. This was this was in my in my thirties. In your thirties. Okay. So <clears throat> I know that you you didn't. St experience formal training like many on this <coughs> program have and like I myself have. It's impressive to me that you somehow picked up eight, nine different instruments and, and could write music to them each and record them. How did you find a way to master them as, as well as you did? I just, I just worked hard. I just practiced all the time. I just, I, I there's no exaggeration. I did, I did play for eight hours most days. Um, got me beat. And I played, I, I, I spent time on all of them. And uh, um, and I would I would write music, but I didn't know how to read or write, and and so I composed these things in my head, or or uh, uh, write the parts for other instruments on the guitar, and then and then learn them on the other instruments. Music theory can be a difficult <clears throat> thing to pick up without an educator. Uh, how did you find that process? Um, I'm I am not really I'm not really schooled in music theory. Um, I, I do what I do, and I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't have a lot, a lot of knowledge beyond that. All the guys in the band have advanced degrees. Um, mm. I am. I'm by far the least accomplished player in in my band. Um, but all these guys, they have advanced degrees, and they're all. Um, almost all of them are also music educators. How did you get interested? We talked a little bit earlier about looking around the world to experience pathos or, or find music you think is more interesting. How did you land on Ethiopian music as something that you really wanted to tackle? Um, I, have, uh, I have a friend who lives in Maryland and he has a, uh, a mail order record company where he sells records that are off the beaten path from all over the place. Mm. And I was at his house when, when the very first um, first record of modern, uh, first modern record of, of tradition-based Ethiopian music um, 
was released in 87, and I was at his house when they arrived, and he put it on, and it was Aramela Mela by Mahmoud Ahmed, mm -hmm. who now lives in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I didn't know that. Oh. It, it took five seconds for me to be hooked for life. It's, it's just incredibly beautiful and mysterious, and mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like anything else. E Ethiopia is is a, a unique case. Ethiopia is the only country in Africa that's never colonized. Mm. The, the Italians were there in World War II, but they didn't, but they didn't really change the culture. And it was never colonized. And they, um, the Ethiopians are very um, serious about protecting their, their, um, their culture from outside influences, in, in, including uh, other African influences. So right. consequently, it doesn't sound like anything else. And it's, um, it just hooked me instantly. What would you say are some of the, the <laughs> elements to Ethiopian music that make it sound so unique? Um, it's all uh, it's it's all based on uh, four different pentatonic scales that are that are out of the ordinary for the Western ear, and uh, uh, it's it's I mean that. That's the building block blocks, and that makes it that makes it sound unique. But it's got it's got a very um, mysterious quality. It it certainly does. I mean, the the repeated pieces of melody that we're hearing tonight certainly evoke mystery to me. And like I said earlier, those rhythms really made me feel a little bit trance-like. Like I was yeah, I get bound there. by a spell by this music. It was really quite something remarkable. It made my body move, made my head move, made my heart move. I'm right there with you. <laughs> As somebody with crippling uh, performance anxiety, uh, stage fright, how did you get to the stage? How did you become a professional performer? <coughs> um, on the last day of 1995, my wife died. Oh. And it was, it was sudden and tragic. And when uh, um, I was I was uh, a mess. I, mm. I was uh, sinking fast and desperately needed something to look forward to. Mm. And I decided to force myself to join a band for the first <laughs> time in my life. So I joined my favorite band. And uh, um, I was in that band for, for uh, three years. Wow. And in, in the year before I joined the band, they, they had... They had gone through a long period of time where they played a lot, but they they had uh, really slowed down, and they only played six or eight performances the year before I joined. And, but mm. I really needed it, so I really pushed, and we played a hundred gigs in those in those three years. Come on. And and I I had terrible performance anxiety. The very first gig we did was. Um, at the Bird Theater, we were in the pit doing a live soundtrack to a classic uh, film, a Buster Keaton film, oh. and and we did one song of ours before the, the film started, and they made me play unaccompanied for like the first 30 seconds, oh, and, uh, wow. um, and I was just petrified. It was just, it was bad, and it stayed that way for a little while, but we were playing a lot, and so within just a few months, uh, at uh, at gig 14, it was gone, mm -hmm. which is really surprising to me because there were, it was the largest show that we ever did. It was mm -hmm. like 2,000 people, what? but it was but it was gone, and it didn't come back. Where was this uh, event? With it was you? an outdoor thing in Fredericksburg. Oh wow! Yeah, it was part of the of the now defunct Blue Bluemont concert series. Now, had this band that your favorite band had they heard you play before it? No, but they were pals. Oh, okay. All right. I was just trying to figure out how did you just decide you were going to be in this band? I mean, and they... they'd, they'd heard some of my, some of them had heard some of my music, but um, they had actually invited me to join when they, had, when they first formed in uh, 1984, and mm. I, de I declined. Mm. Did but, they know about the uh, performance anxiety? Yes. Did they know how much medicine they were offering you by letting you oh, yes. come and play with them? Oh, yes. They actually performed at my and my wife's uh, wake. Wow. Yeah. What a beautiful and, and tragic story all at once. Afros and All Stars comes together six years ago. We are coming, hopefully, prayerfully, <coughs> fingers crossed fully, to the end of a pandemic. How often have you been able to get together 
throughout this time? We haven't. Oh, wow. Uh, we, we, we did two gigs last week. We played, um, we played a Festival of Arts show on Thursday night, and then we played at Bramley Park on uh, Saturday night. Mm. And we rehearsed on, on Tuesday. And that was, other than the other guitar player who I saw twice, like I saw him in May and June, it was the first time that I had laid eyes on anybody in the band since the 10th of March last year. Wow. Yeah. Now you're incredibly tight as a group for having not come together uh, for so long and, and so infrequently for such a long time. How are you, how do you lead a group of, of this size without having much rehearsal? Well, <clears throat> the secret is in their professionalism. You know, the, the, the previous band that I was in, we could learn most anything, but, but none, of us were, uh, none of us were trained. And sometimes it would take a long time. We'd have to beat it to death. With, with these guys, with most music, I can just hand it to them. They look at it. They, most of the time, they play it correctly the first time through. Yeah. The first time through. The... the um, young lady that was playing with us today, Susie Fisher, is, is, a, is, is just a, a brilliant musician, a brilliant player, and um, she's played with us maybe a dozen times. She's never rehearsed with us. Mm. <laughs> That's hard to believe. I mean, that instrument almost the size as she is, and she made it sing, that alto, she made it sing, she played in harmony with someone who's plays with you all the time. She's, a, she's a poet on those horns. A poet on those horns. I, I can agree with that. And I think there's something, something to say about a man who didn't spend his life studying formally, leading a group of people who have, and they seem to trust what you have to offer. Well, it's, it's a, a testament to the spirit of this music. Mm. Um, all of these guys were aware of Ethiopian music and intrigued by it, but had never had an opportunity to, to delve into it. So when I, when I approached everybody and told them what it was that I wanted to do, everybody was immediately intrigued right. and, and jumped right on it. Um, I, I, uh, I mean, that's, that's all I can say. It's not me, it's the music. <laughs> uh, that, that pathos we talked about earlier. Uh, really pulls at the string and really comes through in the sound, and I appreciate you for that. I, Ethiopian music is something I'm learning. You're helping me uh, on that journey. I've never performed it. Thank you, George, so much. I could talk your ear off the rest of the night, but these folks at home would rather hear you play. You ready for set two? Very ready. All right, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. So we are back, and we're going to do... We're going to do a set of all Ethiopian material. Um, this first piece was written by the great Mulatu Estatke, and the name of it is Yeketit, uh, which in Amharic translates as February, which was the month in which the totalitarian takeover of Ethiopia uh, in the 70s took place that ended up shutting down their culture for the better part of two decades and nearly robbed us of all this beautiful music.
Thank you. Scott Milstead on drums, Keith Cable on congas. Myrick Crampton on the tenor. We're going to continue with another Ethiopian piece. This one is called Gure Gigna.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this next tune, it's based on a classic Ethiopian tune. It's about the Ethiopian tradition of when uh, a young man is sweet on a young lady, he demonstrates, demonstrates it by giving her a lemon. <laughs> Girls love lemons. Thank you. 
Chris Vossi on guitar. Myrick Crampton on the tenor. Damnation. <laughs> oh, man. Killing me. Um, we're going to close things out with the most well-known of the classic Ethiopian tunes. Um, the song was written in 1974 by the great Germa Beene. And uh, he's in his 80s now, and just a couple of years ago, he, he put out uh, a new record and actually played in Richmond. And, and I got to meet him. It was a fine moment, and it's a fine tune. It's called Music How We Silt.
boy virtual. What was this jazz around the museum? It wasn't our regular jazz cafe tonight. I'm gonna tell you what, this man right here had a ball tonight. <laughs> and so did I, thank you for that. Thank you all for that tonight. I really appreciated you all. Afros and all stars, everybody. Check them out every chance you get. BJ Brown, you did it again. Sent us the music we needed, especially on a, a summer night like this one. Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe. Oh, that's what we're doing. Dominion Energy, thank you for shipping us the little bit of pocket change we can put in, into each one of their pockets. Maybe you can buy a sandwich on your way home. To remember Tommy Productions, thank you for being here to help us capture this all and Chris in the booth to mix it all so that our ears are just as happy as our hearts. To those of you at home, thank you for loving with us. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for learning from us. In Richmond, Virginia, at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts from the Leslie Cheek Theater stage, this has been our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Around the Museum in the same room. I'm Robert Fennard. Good night. <laughs>